Kathy's trying to escape out the back door into the kitchen. <laughs> She's our director. And Emily, I think, is hiding in the kitchen. So, and then we have Linda Layton. Woo, I'm not hiding in the kitchen. And then we have two more board of directors over here. We have Melissa and April. Woo! Lorraine was here yesterday helping set up, and Anne lives in Brantford, so it's a little bit harder for her to go on. And I'm taking, I'm stealing all okay, of the butter tonight. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge the, um, all of your work and to say thank you very much for all of your support over the years. I've certainly felt it and the organization is so much better for all of your support. So, yeah. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Ingemar Homes, uh, we are a nonprofit organization committed to ending gender-based violence by providing second stage housing, outreach, and programming to women and their children serving Woodstock in Oxford County. We opened our doors in 1989 and were, at the time, the second transitional housing organization in all of Ontario, which I thought was pretty cool. Since its inception, we've been able to serve thousands of families to help them get back on their feet and live their lives free of violence. And some of you may not be familiar with work, but for our newer guests, here's a quick overview. The Women's Immigrant Resource Center was actually born from Ingamo Family Homes. Ingamo Family Homes is what it was called before, and now it's Ingamo Homes. Um, in 1990, work started as a small employment program that moved from unit to unit, to unit to unit to unit, as the house, homes were filled with women who were needing housing resources. As the program outgrew the Ingamo space, work moved to downtown Woodstock and eventually became its own corporate entity with the board of directors. Work is a nonprofit registered charity organization that provides frontline employment services free to anyone who identifies as a woman in Oxford County. So we wanted to begin by sharing some definitions and highlighting some local statistics with you as abuse rank remains an unspoken secret for many families. So Stats Canada defines gender-based violence as harm faced by individuals solely based on their gender, gender expression, gender identity, and or perceived gender. Gender-based violence is an umbrella term that takes on many forms, such as domestic and or intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and or sexual exploitation, otherwise known as human trafficking. It is not limited to physical violence and can include any word, action, or attempt to degrade, control, humiliate, intimidate, coerce, deprive, threaten, or harm another person. It can take on many forms, including cyber, physical, sexual, societal, psychological, emotional, and economic violence, including neglect, discrimination, and harassment. Certain populations experience this violence disproportionately, which includes women, young women and girls, indigenous women and girls, black women and girls, newcomer women to Canada, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and people of other sexual orientation other than heterosexual, transgender and gender diverse people, women living in northern, rural, or remote communities, women living with disabilities, and senior women. Although we have made progress on normalizing the realities of abuse, many women and children continue to suffer in silence and are forced to choose between homelessness or violence. Some of these numbers that I'm about to share with you may be difficult to hear, so please take care while listening. Did you know that 75% of women who are experiencing homelessness today have experienced gender-based violence? 75%. In 2022, Woodstock Police Services and OPP responded to 1,570 domestic violence related calls here in Oxford County. Domestic Abuse Services Oxford, otherwise known as DASO, which is the Women's Emergency Shelter, responded to 2,811 calls related to gender based violence in the last year. This is an increase by 900% over the last 10 years. So in 2013, they responded to 288. 
Individuals living in rural regions experience a prevalence of gender-based violence that is significantly higher than that of their urban counterparts, enduring physical abuse that is substantially more severe. In 2019, women living in rural areas of the provinces of Canada experienced rates of intimate partner violence that were almost twice as high as women living in urban areas, areas with rates close to four times higher than those for men in these areas. This is due to the close-knit nature and small size of rural communities, which contributes to a greater level of community denial about the problem of violence within families. Denial often stems from a lack of community awareness, lack of anonymity within communities, and a misconception that violence is an urban issue that affects those of a specific socioeconomic status, ethnic origin, race, or age. Perpetrators of violence in rural areas perpetuate more chronic and severe violence due to higher rates of substance use, unemployment, and life stressors. Based on our current housing crisis, women are often left with two choices, whether they experience homelessness or live in violence. So we stand before you today to add you to our voices, although we know that you're already there. So shouting out the need for our services here in Oxford County. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> so work sees nearly 400 women each year and has always recognized and addressed the unique challenges that women face in the workforce. We offer a safe space for programs, supports, and resources that promote gender equity. Work has a holistic, client-centered focus in delivering our range of services, which goes beyond job placements, um, employability skills workshops, one-to-one -one employment counseling and job search support, career development, referrals, and other resources that address the holistic needs of highly barriered women. When basic needs are not met, employment and job retention are jeopardized. Without employment and financial security, safety and well-being are at risk. Work walks with women on their journeys from survival to sustainable livelihoods. We support each woman to understand her grow to understand and grow her personal, financial, social, human, and physical assets through creative, innovative, needs-based programming that meets her needs and responds to the evolving labor market. We also connect her with available community resources. I've said it before, but the COVID-19 pandemic set working women in Canada back significantly as the female labor force participation rate is at its lowest level in over 30 years. In 2021, actually really just this year, but we're gonna go with 2021 because that's what it says, the County of Oxford released its Safe and Well Oxford Plan. The prevention and social development priorities identified in the Safe and Well Oxford Communities Plan are aligned with work's approach to inspiring hope enabling change, and empowering women who, or empowering people who identify as women. Work's contribution to safe and well Oxford communities is currently under threat due to changes in Employment Ontario's funding model and priorities. Under the new model, without additional resources, it will be impossible for work to sustain our holistic approach to sustainable livelihoods with people who identify as women across Oxford County. In fact, under Employment Ontario, women are not considered a priority population. Shame, shame, shame. Shame. The new model does not provide resources to support women facing multiple barriers to safety and well-being, nor intersecting risks of homelessness, violence, exclusion, discrimination, and mental health crisis. Instead, it is designed for people who are employment ready. We know that many women, and particular women who are indigenous, refugees, newcomers, asylum seekers, members of the 2SLGBTQ plus community, and or have disabilities, need that pre-employment and job retention supports in order to move from survival, surviving to sustainable livelihoods. We don't want to leave you all on a bleak note. <laughs> that is the energy I'm feeling right now in the room. Because we know that hearing some of this can be really hard to digest. However, we want to highlight them as this is what we see every single day. But there is hope. Our hope is that through education and information sharing, we can begin educating youth and those in intimate relationships about what healthy relationships look like and to bring awareness and find ways of intervening before things escalate. Through Works Employment Services, we can enhance each woman's employability 
so they may achieve a more sustainable livelihood by building confidence, skills, and knowledge to obtain appropriate and suitable employment and or further education and training. Your contributions today are going to support us in continuing with our much needed awareness efforts so that we can create pathways towards prevention and employability. If you want to continue learning more and being part of change, please don't hesitate to follow us on our social medias. We've got Dart Oxford, Ingemo Holmes underscore Woodstock. We've also got Women's Employment Resource Center where you can find them on Facebook um, or on their Instagram, which is Work Woodstock. We frequently share educational content as well on these socials. I also want to do one last shameless plug. Um, November is Women Abuse Prevention Month, and throughout our community, we will be offering numerous events and initiatives. One upcoming event is our flag raising ceremony on November 1st at the County Building at 9.30. Mark your calendar, folks. We will also be selling the wrapped Encouraged Scarves that, you'll, that you're welcome to purchase if you already haven't done so. I did bring a few in. They're over there. They're really beautiful. They're uh, all very unique. None of them are the same. Yes, those ones. Um, they're actually made from recycled saris, which is really cool. Um, so if you're interested, just let me know. Um, As we celebrate Persons Day in Canada, we also celebrate the incre incredible strength, resilience, and determination of the women that we serve. Tonight, in the spirit of this historic day, we have come together with the generous support of the Uniform Women's Committee, Local ADA, woo, to make a difference in the lives of our clients. This fundraiser is not just about raising funds, it's about raising women up and helping them break through the barriers that hold them back. Both organizations need you and your support more than ever, even when we realize how difficult times are for each and every one of you. We extend our heartfelt thanks to every supporter who's joined us here tonight. Your unwavering commitment to equity, empowerment, and justice is what's making this evening so special. Together, we are creating a brighter and more inclusive future for all women, regardless of the obstacles that they face. As we leave this gathering, let us carry with us the knowledge that just as the women of the past fought for our rights and freedoms, we are carrying the torch forward, illuminating the path for the women of our future. Thank you for being part of this vital journey, and may we continue to honor and celebrate Persons Day by empowering women and breaking down barriers together. Thank you, Heather and Joanna, for speaking with us and for everything that you do. Um, it, that presentation that you just gave us made it even more clear as to why Unifor Local 88 especially, and the women of Unifor Local 88, and our friends and community need to come together to give a hand to keep you guys going. So the last round of municipal elections saw sweeping and awesome changes in many rural communities. And that definitely held true here in Ingersoll as well. Our next speaker, is a champion of making Ingersoll more inclusive and welcoming to newcomers and visible minorities. And it's wonderful to see her passion and dedication to this community that has become her home. Hailing originally from Nigeria and moving into the area about eight years ago now. Was it eight years? It was. <laughs> Khadija became an avid supporter, an active member of the community and then, a little more than a year ago, stepping up to challenge for one of the seats on council. I personally recall seeing her in, attend in attendance at just about every single All Candidates forums that we hold here at Unifor 88, <coughs> long before she ever tossed her hat in the ring. Sisters and brothers, please help me welcome Councillor Khadija Halu. <laughs> So I'm going to go right to it. <laughs> so as I stand here before you today, feeling very profoundly honored to share my story with you. It's a story that was made possible by the encouragement of our Deputy Mayor, Lindsay Whitson. 
Lindsay and her wavering support uh, of, uh, of this community, a journey that began in predominantly white town, is why my story is possible today. It's a story of empowerment, belief, and the power of representation. Deputy Mayor Lindsay Wilson believed in me, and that belief was the spark that ignited my confidence to run for council in a town where I might have felt like an outsider. Just knowing that a few people believed in me and recognized my capabilities was enough to push me forward. And with that belief and the support of the community, I ran and I won. This experience has shown me the welcoming embrace of a community ready to give more women a chance, more diverse voices a chance. My conviction is simple, yet profound. For democracy to truly win, women must be represented. I'm not just a representative of my constituents, I'm a voice for the underrepresented as well as a woman, and an advocate for those who may, not, who may feel overlooked. I've always believed that a thriving democracy requires the active participation of women in every facet of governance, because we are the majority population. My journey didn't end with winning the council seat. It was just the beginning. I took it upon myself to learn and grow, to become a more effective advocate for my community, and I delved into the intricacies of municipal governance through, again, the municipal school started by Lindsay Wilson and Kate Letterbrook. And Ontario Municipal Associations as well have helped and broaden my horizon. All the while, fueled by my passion for my community, which is deeply rooted in my upbringing and the culture of giving back. I'd like to share with you a little more about my personal journey. As it has shaped who I am today, I grew up as one of 20 siblings. In a family, I'm very proud of that. In a family that emphasized the importance of giving, whether it was in our time or skills. My father was a very successful man, very successful in life. He had 15 girls, that's rich. <laughs> and he was a businessman with a prominent, was a prominent figure known for hosting events, you know, and representing our community and government delegations as well. His commitment to serving the community inspired me to study governmental administration. I served so well in the university that I was my, in my second year, I was elected first ever woman president of any state student union. While I pursued a degree in public administration, the irony of it all is my first job was in a local government office working in personal administration. <laughs> and I always felt my comfortable place was in government. So my life experiences, education, and the years spent living in different continents from Europe to the US and coming here into Canada, before settling, have all contributed to who I am today. But my Canadian story truly began in a small town called Mission, BC. In 2006, where I hit the ground running, offering to volunteer for the Fraser Valley Crisis Line. We arrived in 2006, May, and by October, I knew that this was my calling. I had done this because it was my way of getting to know my new country deeper beneath the surface and understand where I could help because, you see, I had arrived with half a master's done in human services and mental health from Bellevue University in Nebraska. It was a mission, and in mission, I had the privilege of meeting Canada's first black mayor, who had just moved from Kenya to pursue a master's in urban planning, and his journey, like mine, began with a vision to make mission a city for the future. For immigrants like us, when given the chance, our education becomes a vessel to serve and our experiences become tools to shape the world around us. I must also acknowledge the challenges that many immigrants, especially those from diverse backgrounds, face when trying to find their place in a new community. Sometimes local businesses or organizations may hesitate to hire individuals because you cannot pronounce their names or are uncomfortable with their display of confidence. I have felt sidelined many times where and when I wanted a job so badly. I think it's important to recognize this confidence doesn't stem from arrogance, but from an eagerness to contribute, to work, and to serve. So I stand before you today to encourage everyone, from those who need help and are afraid to ask, to the employers and the community leaders who offer opportunities. If there is one thing I hope you'll take away from this, it's the importance of reaching out and giving opportunities to visible minorities who have so much to offer. It only takes one person opening their hearts and minds to something bigger than themselves to create a more inclusive, vibrant community. Thank you, Lindsay. 
as the holiday season starts, even looking around in this event, I hope it's one of, I hope it's one of the most, uh, the last times I feel unease because I'm the only race in the room and I brought my sister today to, to help out. <laughs> let's deliberately seek to invite others who may not be invited. So let's seek, let's seek them as a way to share their experience, these experiences. The more we are deliberate to include others, the more beautiful it is. I want to thank the Women Unifold Local Committee again for inviting me to speak and honoring what my my little world now realizes is an achievement and that will go down in history. But I hope many more follow and I'm honestly so proud of Ingersoll for being the progressive as we saw in the last election. In conclusion, our journey is never defined by where we start but by uh, where we aim to go and the steps we take to get there. Let us be the change we wish to see in our communities and in our democracy. Together we can create a future where diversity and representation truly thrive, making our society stronger, more inclusive, and reflective of the values we hold dear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khadija, for sharing your story with us. I, as I said, I recall numerous times watching the poor panicked faces on the candidates at the front of the room when they saw that you came in. And I don't believe it was because you were someone who appeared different or were diverse. It's because they knew you were going to hold the ask the tough questions <laughs> and hold it to it. And I, I, and I think you were one of them, uh, Lindsay. Just saying. Um, it, it was always a pleasure. But I was getting excited when I saw you on the list for uh, city council or town council. I was duly pleased. Just saying, it's one of those political animals, you know. <laughs> so now for our next speaker of the evening. As another integral part of those sweeping and awesome political local changes, and uh, an economic development official for a nonprofit called Community Futures Oxford, and one of the co-founders of the Municipal Campaign School for Ox of Oxford County, which encourages more diverse representation in local politics, and a founder and leader, who by the way never considered running herself, <laughs> Lindsay Wilson stepped up to the challenge and was confidently elected as the first female deputy mayor of Ingersoll, Ontario. <laughs> the next part I believe Lindsay had a great part in as well. She brings a strong voice to a now majority female council. <laughs> in Ingersoll. And I have no doubt that she will confirm exactly why she gained the support of her beloved community. Please help me welcome Ingersoll Deputy Mayor Lindsay Wilson. for joining us tonight at the Unifor Local 88's 7th Annual Persons Day Gala and the 94th year of some women earning the right to seek office. A year ago today, we would have been in the final days of our campaign, so being here tonight and having the honor to share of my experience is surreal. And my dad is here, a retired 636 member, so when you grow up in a, a union family, <laughs> The union blessed our family with a beautiful life, so I feel very comfortable in the union hall, so it's really special to share this in this space. I see many women in this room that I admire, that I know have worked longer and harder than me to achieve gender equity, and who have demonstrated solidarity maybe for longer than I've been alive. You have paved the way for me in your own way, and tonight I want to talk about how important it is that we continue that legacy of keeping the door open. I couldn't talk about how I ended up here without going back to January of 2018. I was organizing some leadership training to build capacity and the young people in our community. And around the same time, women's marches were happening all over North America in response to the Me Too movement. I read a news article about a woman named Kate Leatherbarrel, who was organizing the Women's March in Woodstock. I was so impressed with what she was doing that I found her on Facebook and I sent her a message and I encouraged her to come to the leadership training. We were complete strangers, but I recognized in her 
something that our community needed. I went back to that same news article, and there's a quote from Kay that rings just as true today as it did then. She said, I believe there need to be some progressive minds, and there's a popular quote that said, she persisted, and I plan on persisting. Later that year, Kate ran and lost her first municipal campaign by just under 70 votes. But as many of you will know, Kate persisted and is now the councillor for the city of Woodstock. During Kate's campaign, she attended campaign schools in other cities that were crucial to her success. And when she lost in 2018, we made a commitment that we would bring municipal campaign school to our community. So three long years later, on October 25th of 2021, we launched Municipal Campaign School with a very clear goal of encouraging and supporting women to run for office. We had every intention of bringing people together in person, but by January, Omicron had hit and we moved everything online. So we partnered with the Municipal Campaign School in Wellington and Guelph to work together to bring a series of videos that covered every topic we could think of door knocking, finances, paperwork, social media, but some of the best videos were the ones where we interviewed women who were already serving on councils. One of the women we interviewed was Deputy Mayor of Zora, just down here, Katie Gregg. When Deputy Mayor Gregg was first elected, she was within weeks of having her son. She breastfed at meetings, and he had a bouncy chair right beside her in the council chambers. So she talked a lot about that in her interview. Fast forward a little bit after that, and we were all at our first conference as elected officials, and Katie, Kate, and I were chatting in the hotel lobby. Someone approached Katie because they recognized her from the video. She's from Eastern Ontario and happened to come across it. She approached Katie to say that her video convinced her that she could run too. This woman was elected for the first time, and she and Katie still keep in touch to support one another. Municipal Campaign School led us to the 2022 municipal election, where a record number of women were elected to office across Oxford County. Many of them for the first time. The city of Woodstock and the town of Ingersoll achieved gender parity on their councils. But I don't share this to say that it was a municipal campaign school that made all of this possible. I had never even run for office before. A record number of women were elected because people like you showed up for us. You probably talked to your friends about it over coffee, or maybe you even convinced your partner to go for the very first time. So as much as I am here sharing my experience, this story is not about me. This story is about how women are coming together to build community and to extend an invitation to all of you to participate alongside us. We cannot lead with our ego. We lead with the goal of making it easier for the leaders who are yet to come, especially black, indigenous, and women of color, especially 2SLGBTQIA plus leaders who continue <laughs> who continue to face barriers, but whose voices are desperately needed at the table. Let us not forget that Indigenous women and women of Asian heritage were not included in the original decision to declare women as people, and they continue to be underrepresented to this day. On the morning after women were declared as persons, Nellie McClung wrote an op-ed in the newspaper titled, Now That We Are Persons. In that article, she said, all that the decree can do for us has been done, but let no one think a miracle has happened and that sex prejudice will flee away like the morning mist at sunrise. Prejudice dies hard, as we all know. And when belief runs back to antiquity, a ruling of the Privy Council cannot dislodge it. It's been 94 years, so let's not mince words. Antiquated beliefs are knocking at our door. Women's rights are not safe, and 2SLGBTQIA plus community is facing more violence and more discrimination than ever before. Despite all of the progress we have made, or perhaps because of all of the progress we have made, there are forces that would like to drag us backwards. So what can we do? 
It is our responsibility to extend our hand and invite women into our circle. It is our responsibility to make sure our neighbors know they belong. We aren't polarized. We are disconnected. Take the time to connect. There's probably a woman you have met, but never told her you see her courage. Tell her and invest your time in supporting each other. When we invest our time in advancing one another's strengths, the progress we have made cannot be undone. On per Persons Day, we honor the work of the Famous Five and all of the women who walked through an open door after them. On Persons Day, I honor each of you who made it possible for me to be here. In the face of forces that would like to take us back in time, let us recommit to the solidarity that is necessary to see us through to the next chapter. We cannot reach the glass ceiling only to slam the door shut behind us. When you recognize courage in the women around you, tell them so. Bring each of them into the circle until no one is left standing on the outside. Thank you so much for being here and thank you to Local ADA and the Women's Committee for putting this together. It's really nice to celebrate with each of you and I just have so much gratitude for getting to do this in my, in my own community. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lindsay, for sharing your time and your wisdom with us this evening. You know, what a wonderful group of fabulous women to hear from this evening. I, I don't know about you, but as I said, I'm a political animal, and, and hearing that we can do this, and actually I was having a conversation earlier today with an MP uh, that was in the room, but unfortunately had to leave, and she was like, hey, so are you going to be the candidate? No. No, no. no I, I, I admire and I am inspired by all of you. I'm not the candidate. <laughs> not the candidate. Ever. Uh, so I would ask two of the people responsible for bringing this evening together for us from our local 88 Women's Committee, the co chairs, Victoria Gore and Benita McCarthy. I'd like you to come up to the microphone, please. I know you have a few things to say. These sisters, along with their committee, have been working so hard for the last several months uh, to make this a beautiful and joyous evening of celebration uh, and to make it possible. So please welcome Benita and Victoria. We have a lot of gratitude for many people who helped to make this night a success. 
We're going to try and keep it short so that we can get back to checking out the auction items and raffle items and socializing and getting our photos taken with Doris. Excuse me. All that fun stuff. So it took a lot of people volunteering their time and skills and we thank you all so very much. To the Women's Committee members, the Communications Committee members, Local 88 Sisters and Brothers, community friends and student volunteers, our work volunteers here in the kitchen as well. Thank you all for your help. It certainly does take a group effort to put together an event like this, and it could not be done without the support from each and every one of you. Thank you all for contributing your time and doing your part for this gala. Colleen, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for agreeing to be our host tonight. You have done a fabulous job. Your, <laughs> your involvement with our local union and politics committee and your personal involvement with politics, your activism, and your spirit have made you the perfect host for us tonight. Well done, sister, and thank you so much. Our seven auction tables and raffle tables are filled with donations from local businesses in Oxford County from local 88 members and supporters of local 88. Our National Union and Workplace General Motors have donated some pretty cool items up for grabs tonight. From Tilsonburg to Stratford and in between, community businesses and citizens recognize the value of the Women's Employment Resource Center and Ingamo Homes. In these hard economic times, local businesses have stepped up to help us and we are truly grateful for the support we have received this year. We will shout out to our supporters later on during the raffle draw as we're trying to keep this short. Yeah. <laughs> Truly, we have a long list of people we'd like to individually recognize and thank, and we're hoping next year we will add a slideshow and make sure that everyone gets proper recognition. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, to our guest speakers, Kahija and Lindsay, thank you for joining us tonight and for sharing your experiences and giving us words <coughs> to reflect on. Women continue to be underrepresented in the political landscape, so to have you both here speaking tonight is inspiring. This is one of the visions that the Famous Five fought for, empowering women to get involved with politics and to have the ability to run for office, and then extend that hand out to other women and pull them up along with you. As a local women's committee, we are excited to see your ideas and your vision for Ingersoll take shape in the months and years ahead. And we look forward to working with both of you on future projects. And thank you again for joining us tonight. This room is filled with women who are active in their own lives, whether it be politics, community activism, union activism, or volunteers. All of us in this room carry the spirit and ideals that are shared by the fabulous five. Or famous five. They are fabulous. <laughs> Same for the men in the room too. We cannot leave anyone out. Brothers, you are not forgotten and your continued support and allyship, allyship does not go unnoticed. All of our efforts have value and are important. Tonight we are here to honor sisterhood. We are here to celebrate the achievements we have made in the past 100 years. And we're here to inspire one another and our future generations to continue moving forward and never give up on working towards gender equality and increased representation in our society. Persons Day is a powerful reminder of the strength and determination of women who fought for the right to be recognized as persons under the law. Their perseverance and courage shattered barriers that once restricted women's participation in public life. And it is our responsibility to continue their work and to build upon their achievements. That continued work has been happening ever since that historic decision was made because not all women were included in the 1929 ruling. Indigenous women, Asian women, and black women were not included until years later. The person's case was a starting point, which has paved the way for development of stronger rights for all persons over the years. As we reflect on what we have heard tonight, let us be inspired by the vision of a society where every individual, regardless of gender, race, or background, can actively participate in shaping our collective future. Tonight we urge you to consider how, to get, how you can get involved and make a difference in your community. 
Whether it's joining a local organization, mentoring young leaders, or participating in community events, your contributions matter. Small acts of kindness and service can ripple through our communities, inspiring others to take action and create a chain of positive transformation. Community involvement is the heart and soul of process. When we come together, united in our goals, we have the power to create positive change and improve the lives of those around us. Community involvement takes many forms, from volunteering and advocacy to supporting local initiatives and causes. It's about recognizing the needs of our community and taking action to address them. Each one of us has unique talents and abilities that when combined can make a profound impact. All it takes is one step, reaching out, getting involved in something you feel passionate about, and it grows from there. To the community organizations we are fundraising for tonight, Heather and Joanna, thank you for sharing with us about work in Ingema Homes and the resources that each provides. All of the money raised tonight through our raffle and silent auction will go to both of these agencies. Two agencies that Local 88 has supported for many years. We have both active and retired Local 88 leaders who volunteer their time and abilities and have been doing this for many, many years. Our history runs deep with each resource and we recognize the value that each provides to Oxford County. Just as the Famous Five had identified women's denial of legal personhood as a barrier to the full participation and inclusion of some women in society, Women's Employment Resource Center and Ingamo Homes today continues to identify these barriers that make it difficult for women to leave abusive relationships and to fully participate and be included in society. And, and they work actively to make positive change to remove these barriers for women. We have an information table set up uh, over by the photo stage, so please take a moment tonight to stop by and check it out. Let us carry the spirit of community involvement beyond tonight, making a commitment to be active citizens for positive change. Together, we can build a future where everyone's voice is heard and where opportunities are accessible to all and where equality is not just a dream, it's a reality. Thank you again for coming tonight and thank, thank you everyone for your generosity and for your support to these important agencies. Your presence here demonstrates your belief in the power of women leadership and the potential for positive change in our society. To honor the legacy of the famous five, together let us continue to create a world where women's voices are amplified and their impact is felt in every sphere of life. We will end with a quote from a, from a politician and activist, Rosemary Brown. We must open the doors and we must see to it they remain open so others can pass through. Sisterhood is powerful and once those doors have opened, let us hear, sorry, oh, let us hear the words from Nellie Mithun. Never, never, never explain, never retract, never apologize. Just get the thing done and let them happen. Thank you. Yes, that concludes it. So we'll be back around 9 p.m. to draw for raffle prizes and to close our silent auction. And we just hope that everyone has a wonderful evening. And be sure to stop by and see Doris Weir at some point to get your photo taken to commemorate the evening and make some memories. And as Colleen has mentioned already, uh, the photos will be available on our Flickr page uh, sometime next week. Uh, there's a QR code on your table, and uh, it can also be found on our local website, too, if you want to navigate it through that way. And uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Happy bidding. And <laughs>